Hello there, I'm Kay Ball, and welcome to Human Skills, where I interview tech industry leaders about all the non-technical skills that go into success in the tech industry. Not many people can put chief of staff at Google on their resume, but Eric Nerlich can. He held the role for almost seven years, reporting up to the product VP of Google's search ads team. Knowing only that about him, you might assume our conversation would be about productivity, career success, and effectiveness in a high-powered leadership role. But this conversation is much more human than that. Eric, like many of us, worked himself almost to death because he assumed that that was what success looked like and almost convinced himself there was no other choice until his body forced him to reconsider and the realizations he had set him on the path to his role today as an executive coach. Choice was the theme that kept coming up. The ways we overconstrain ourselves, lose track of the choices that we're making and how that traps us in cycles that are not only painful, but also reduce our impact. Eric shared compelling stories of himself and others, continually highlighting our ability to make choices that align with our values, get comfortable, not making everybody comfortable, and dramatically increase our impact. Please enjoy this conversation with Eric Nerlich. Eric, welcome to the show. Thanks, Kevin. Happy to be here. Yeah. Why don't you get us started and maybe share a little bit about your background and how you came to care about these things that I've been calling human skills? Yeah. So... Oh, gosh, where to start? I mean, I currently work as an executive coach, helping leaders grow their impact, helping them be more effective. And the funny thing about that work is it's not about information. As you can see from my background, if you're on video, I've got a lot of books. And a lot of my leaders have read all the same books. And that turns out not to be the thing that's stopping them from being more effective. It's these human skills. And these human skills require us to connect in different ways, to, to, to relate to the person in front of us in different ways. Um, and, you know, as far as how I came to this point, I, I often say my uh, executive coach origin story was my second job as an engineer. I was actually working as a software engineer back then. I was working at a biotech company and it had one of the best technical teams I ever worked with. I, you know, like world-class technical engineers. We were doing stuff nobody in the world could do. And the company raised $40 million based on the work we were doing. It was going amazing. We were actually building something that was going to work. And somehow we went bankrupt a year later because of absolutely terrible decision-making by the leadership team. Just awful. Mm. And it was this moment of like, wait a second. So it doesn't matter how good of an engineer I am if the CEO is terrible. And mm -hmm. I was like, I got to understand this management thing, this business thing, like something's going on there that's really important. And I used to dismiss all the, you know, other stuff. There's MBA skills. Like, I, I don't need to worry about that. I'm just going to do great technical work and that's going to be enough. And it was like, well, that's clearly not enough. <laughs> so yeah, that's yeah. kind of how I ended up. Uh, I mean, that I, <clears throat> I didn't pull on that thread until much later, but that, that's kind of the bit where I started going like, wow. It's not enough to just focus on the stuff I can measure, the stuff that's quantifiable, the stuff I could do in the lab. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, let's let's maybe start with that. You you had a couple of words there that I want to kind of peel back the onion on, which were uh, impact and effectiveness. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you think about impact when it comes to a leader? It depends. It's actually the first question I ask all my clients. Like, what does success look like to you? Because um, impact could mean a lot of things. Uh, I There's impact on how effective the team is, how you know, well the team is getting its goals accomplished. There's impact on the world. Like, what is the team team's impact and, and effect on the world itself? There And how is that impact measured? It can be measured all sorts of ways. And that's something that I, I spend a lot of time discussing with my clients. Like, what are your values? Like, what is what matters to you? It, it, the, the trite way to put it is, how do you want to measure your life? But that's kind of the fundamental question, I guess, that that, mm -hmm. that uh, obsesses me these days. Yeah. Well, and it, it's hard to pin down sometimes. So do you have practices that you take people through to help identify that like what is actually important to me? Yeah. Um, oh boy, there's a bunch I could I could go with, but I'll start with two that come to mind. One is 
um, just tracking energy. And that may not seem like a very, that, that seems like, that may seem like a very internal metric, but I find that when people are in the flow and they feel energized by what they're doing, they get more done. They're more excited by what they do. They're, 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 and they're more effective at what they do. And so people who are doing work, they find energizing all day, get more done because they have more energy. And so that's kind of an internal metric that I, it can be very effective uh, to help understand the types of activities that maybe one is drawn to. And then a more external metric is a question I often ask is, who do you want to serve? And here's the thing, especially as you become a leader, you can't keep everybody happy. And this is something that drives a lot of my clients crazy because <laughs> they're used to being able to excel and get the gold star from everybody and everybody gets some, gives them an A plus and they exceed expectations for everybody. And then you reach a certain scope as a leader and you have people that want different things under you <laughs> and you can't keep them both happy. It's like, well, what do I do? How do I keep them both happy? I'm like, you, you, you can't, you have to choose. They're like, but then somebody's going to be unhappy with me. I'm like, yeah. I'm like, what do I do? You, you, you choose. Like, there's no secret here. There's no magic trick I have to give you that keeps everybody happy. And the best you can do is articulate. This is what I'm doing. This is how I'm serving. This is the principle I'm using to make this decision. And some people will be unhappy, but at least they'll understand. So to your, you know, circle back to your point about impact, it's like, if I've chosen that I'm going to make, you know, prioritize the team under me, Great. You have a metric. I can get them promoted. I can increase their scope, so forth, so on. If you're saying I'm going to prioritize the company, which is what you kind of should be doing as, a, as an executive, then it's like the company metrics are a, good, are a good proxy. Or if you're working in a nonprofit, you could say, like, this is the community we want to help. How are they benefiting from what we do? Whatever it is, you can find the people you want to help and some measure of their success and use that as a proxy. I love that. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to keep poking it at some of these directions. Sure. So you highlight that you can't make everyone happy. And I think many of us are people pleasers. That's very uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any recommendations for how to get more used to that fundamental <clears throat> trade-off that you have to make of, well, if I make these people happy, these people are going to be unhappy and vice versa. Yeah. I mean, it starts by trying it. <laughs> I mean, there, there's really, <laughs> there's really no answer here. Uh, so uh, I guess I have two stories I'll, I'll, st I'll share here. One was, so I worked at Google for many years and early into my time at Google, I was working way too much, like 8 a.m. to midnight every day. Sometimes I would take Saturday afternoons off, you know, and ouch. Yeah, it was brutal. And the, the really annoying part was I was not actually being that effective or impactful. I'm like, this is not working for me. And my director at the time, a guy named Sanjay Datta, who is now the CFO of Upstart, he, I, he was very effective, very impactful. People up to and including Eric Schmidt, the CEO, and Patrick Pichette, the CFO, would listen to him. And he left work at 6 p.m. each day. And I'm like, how the hell do you do that? He's like, well... I come to work and I work on the most important thing first. And if I don't get to the next thing, that's okay. It's not as important. And you're like, well, that, that, that can't be that easy. But the secret of what he did was he chose what was most important. So people would send him email. He would never respond to emails. People would put meetings on his calendar. He would never show up. The only thing he would work on is the thing he was doing for the CEO and CFO and everybody else could wait and they would be annoyed with them. They'd be like, you're not responding. Why aren't you going to my meeting? I set this meeting up with you. I was like, well, I'm working on something more important. And you know, the, the contrast between what he did and what I was doing was I would show up. I'd spend two hours on email when I get to work. I go to six hours of meetings with anybody who put time on my calendar. I do another round of email at 5 p.m. and then it's 6 p.m. And there's one thing I had to get done that day and I had to start it on it. So I, I was working until midnight every night and he just didn't do any of that. He just started on that thing at 
9 a.m. when he got to work. And then whatever time he had left over, <laughs> then he would uh, you know, spend on emails and meetings. So that that's, yeah. um, I think, you know, part of, to answer your question, like, how do you learn to do it? Like, seeing the difference in impact that he had by being willing to just tell people no and say, this is more important, was really critical for me. Yeah. Well, and I think that's the key that you're, you're showing with that story is that not just like he was telling people no and making them upset. He was being more impactful by doing that. Yes. Yes. And he could see the impact he was having. And he, you know, speaking of my question, who am I serving? He was like, I know who I'm serving. I got the CEO and the CFO waiting on this. And I'm willing to say no to all y'all <laughs> to make sure they're happy. Yep. yep. That's awesome. So one of the things this shows is I think a core principle of possibly life, certainly leadership, certainly engineering, is that there is no absolute best situation or best solves everything. Everything is about trade-offs. Mm -hmm. And one of the things you've highlighted is like you make trade-offs in where you spend your time. You'd make trade-offs in who you're serving. Are there other kind of core trade-offs you've seen show up over and over again? Well, first I want to just reinforce what you just said. Um, that like one of the core principles I think of my leadership coaching practice is clarity and focus. If you are clear on what your priorities are and what's most important, that goes a long way. And when you can focus and say no to other stuff that is not those priorities, then you can have a huge amount of impact. There's this uh, great image from the book Essentialism by Greg McCune, which shows like you have a certain amount of energy. And if you spread it in all directions, it's like little arrows in all directions. You're making a tiny bit of progress. If you take that same amount of energy and you put it all in one direction, it's like an arrow this big. And that's impact. And that's kind of the essence of what I'm talking about here. So I think the main two that you named are the, are the big ones. Like, where am I spending my time? And who are the people I'm saying yes to? And I, I you know, there, there's details beyond that in terms of like, what is the work? I guess the other one is the, what is the work I'm saying yes to? So here's the thing about high performers. They can do a lot of things and they can do a lot of things well. So just because you can do something and even that you can do it well does not mean it's a good use of your time. So this is where we introduce the idea of opportunity cost. What else could you be doing with your time that could be doing more, could be more valuable? So an advisor uh, I heard about once asked the question, are you doing $80 an hour work when you could be doing $8,000 an hour work. And I just love that. Cause it's like $80 an hour work is valuable. Like that's a, that's an important work. Like that, it's not just like somebody, you get somebody off the street to do it's important. But if you're the CEO of your startup and you're not setting the strategic direction and you're not doing fundraising and you're not figuring out the culture and, and the things that are holding your team back, that is millions in, un in opportunities you're missing. And if you're like filling out your expense reports instead of doing that, it's like, what the hell are you doing? So that I think that idea of opportunity cost is really the, is another kind of key concept here. Yeah. Oh, but they're all such interesting things too. <laughs> <laughs> and that's okay. Like I, I've actually been talking about this with a bunch of uh, clients recently, people that are like CTOs and VPs of engineering and, like, they like playing with technology. Like, that's why they got into this. They like playing with technology. And they're like, I know it's not the most valuable thing. Like, it fails that test of $80 work versus $8,000 work. The most valuable work they could be doing is like what one of them derisively calls politician work. Uh, I have to go talk to my cross-functional partner. I got to go talk to the CEO. I got to smooth this over. I got to deal with this people issue. And all that stuff is actually draining for him. Mm-hmm. And so <clears throat> there are times when it's actually okay to do the stuff that's quote unquote objectively less valuable because you need to do something to keep yourself 
energized to build up your energy so you can handle the draining stuff. Otherwise you can't do this job sustainably. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that's key is right. It's not that you have a fixed amount of energy. It's that some things give you energy and some things take it away. Yeah. And you can't always do only the things that give you energy because those might be only the $80 an hour problems. Mm -hmm. But if you only do the things that drain you, you're not going to last. You're not going to last. And the funny thing is a lot of my clients are the type of people that are like, well, this is hard and I'm good at doing hard things. So I'm just going to muscle through this and I'm going to push through this hard thing. And like, yeah, it doesn't get better. Like there, 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 there's no way to, for you to keep the, You can do this for six months. Sure. Maybe a year. But like, if you want to keep doing this job for more than a year or two, you have to figure out a more sustainable way to handle it. And that means finding the things that energize you and incorporating them into your week, even if they're not necessarily the most quote unquote valuable, because it's also not valuable to the company if you quit and burn out. Yeah. So let's get tactical on a couple of these things. So you highlighted clarity and focus are big themes mm -hmm. of your coaching. And I, there's tremendous value there. Do you have particular exercises or practices that you will take people through to get clear on their own priorities? Yeah. I mean, I guess it's, I think generically, one thing I, I often ask people to do is talk about what is important in their life. And it's like, you know, maybe their family, the work they're doing, their friends, whatever it is. And then I ask them to look at their calendar and look at where they actually spend their time. And, you know, I, just as a rough, you know, rough metric, I say like, you have basically a hundred hours a week if you actually sleep and, you know, take care, like do minimal self-care. So how are you spending that hundred hours? And if 90 of it, 90 or a hundred of it's on work, <laughs> that's a choice. You can do it. I certainly did it for several years, but it meant I was sacrificing everything else in my life. And, you know, then I eventually made a different choice. Uh, maybe I'll, maybe I'll tell that story here. But so after that, uh, this 8 a.m. to midnight kind of working schedule, and I was doing that for multiple years at Google, I hit a point where my body just gave out. Um, I'd been working, I'd been told that is what I had to do to get promoted. And I was like, well, I'm going to do whatever it takes to get promoted. So I'm, I'm going to prove I earned this. I'm going to prove I deserve this next promotion. And uh, yeah, and then I got <clears throat> to Christmas Day and my body just collapsed. Like I had 103 degree fever. I was in bed for a week. And I'm lying there going like, okay, I haven't seen any friends. I'm not even going to see my family because I'm too sick. Um, what do I want this promotion so much for? Like, what, what am I doing? And for the first time in my life, I was like, what if I said no? What if, you know, pleasing my manager wasn't the highest imperative for me? And I went into my office. I went into the office in the first meeting I had with my manager. I'm like, yeah, that's, that's not happening again. I'm done working that hard. And she was mm -hmm. like, uh, if you can't handle it, I'm going to give the work to somebody that can. I'm like, okay. That means you're not getting that promotion if you can't do the work. I'm like, I understand. So she took away half my team. She slashed my performance rating from strongly exceeds expectations to barely meeting expectations. And the thing that I thought would be the end of the world, which is those consequences, wasn't. I was like, this is actually kind of nice. I'm working 40 or 50 hours a week. I get paid the same. I have time to hang out with friends and do things I enjoy. And wait, why did I care so much about that promotion anyway? And it was just this, it was the first time I kind of realized I had a choice in that way. And it really kind of set me on the path that then led to me, me becoming a coach because this moment of clarity, I would almost say this epiphany was like, wow, do other people know that they can have a choice too? And I look around, I'm like, no, they don't. <laughs> I, I, I want to I tell, tell them this. <laughs> it's funny because I feel like I've seen that as well in many situations where people are operating on some 
some train they've, they've gotten on a train somewhere and maybe it's they are on the academic train and they're like okay and i'm going to go to grad school and then i'm going to be a postdoc and then i'm going to be a researcher and then like yada 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 or maybe it's the promotion train or what have you mm-hmm. but the realization of choice is missing yeah i'm curious have you found anything that helps people see that beyond be, that doesn't require 103 degree fever and a week in bed and a crisis <laughs> um <laughs> i'd like to believe that i i help people see that as a coach uh and i've helped a few people through to to understand more of the option the options that are more available to them than, than they think by asking them to talk me through like okay so what happens if you don't make your manager happy if you don't get that promotion, if you don't, whatever. And talking it through and then sharing my own story often helps them go, oh, wait, maybe there's a possibility. And this is where I I often use the framework of experiments to help people kind of realize they have a choice. Like, I'm not saying like, quit your job tomorrow and go do something else. I'm saying, what happens if you push back on this one thing in a small, safe way. Now, oh, they'd never accept that. I'm like, can we try it? And they try it and like, huh, that didn't go as I expected. And then with those, then we can kind of extend a little further and a little further. And that's how you can realize there's more choice available. Yeah. Now, if somebody doesn't have an amazing coach that they're working with, how might they apply that for themselves? Yeah, I mean, I think um, one exercise I actually run people through is to think of somebody that they know who has what they want. Um, So like, you know, it could be executive presence, it could be influence, it could be lots of things. Um, And I'm like, okay, look at that person. Watch what they do. And then look at what you do. What's different? They're like, oh, well, that person does, you know, has these conversations, or that person does this, or whatever it is. Okay, there's your first experiment. Can you try being more like that? And they try it, and sometimes it works, and sometimes it doesn't. But it's like, okay, now at least we're in a different loop. It's not, I can't do it. It's like, oh, what's a different thing I could try? And so, like, that's the, I think that's the hardest step is realizing I could try something different, and coming up with something to try that is not just the default reaction that I've learned over the previous decades of my life that's been very effective for me, that got me to where I am. Because that's why it's so hard to change, because it means letting go of something that works. Like, I have this tool that works great, and you're asking me to put it down and pick up something that I don't know how to use. I don't like that. Understandably so. And that that's kind of, I mean, that's why I'm talking to you is like, I want to share it. Like, no, you, you, you can try something different. (laughs) Totally. I think to some extent, what we're talking about here is mental models, right? We have a model for how we are in the world. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's how we approach work. Maybe it's how we make our decisions, whatever it is. And what you're saying is, well, yes, that works within some domain. Yeah. But it's clearly not serving you in some other domain. Mm -hmm. So you need to unlearn that or learn the edges of that and where you need to apply something else. Yeah. Um, I work with a lot of engineering leaders. So I often put this in terms of like loosening constraints. Like your problem is over constrained. That's why you're stuck. Because you have this rule that says you can only do this and this rule that says you can only do this and this rule that says you can only do this. And there's no room at the middle that allows you to move. And that's why you're stuck. So how can we loosen one of those constraints? So like I once um, uh, once saw at a workshop, this guy work with a client, basically live coaching them. And the, the rule they had was like, I can never ask for help. And that's kind of a good rule as an engineer in a lot of ways, because it's like, I'm going to figure this out. I'm going to solve the problem. I'm going to, you know, show that I can be independent and learn it myself. But there's times when it holds you back. <clears throat> there's times, I mean, 
I guess this, this was many years ago. So this is before like Stack Overflow and things like that. It's like, oh, no, of course, you just look it up on Stack Overflow. Um, but uh, there's, but the this guy who worked with this person is like, I can never ask for help. Well, let's invert that. I never want to ask for help. Like, or I can ask for help if these conditions apply. Like, I, there's an expert I know, or I'm physically limited for some reason, or whatever. And you start realizing, oh, there's exceptions. I can I can create exceptions for myself around this, and then loosen that constraint a little bit. And if you do that, a number of constraints are like, oh wait, now there's some room to move. But if, when you put these mental models or these rules in terms of absolutes, I must always, I can never. That's when you get really stuck. I like that as a framing. So you're you're basically taking this model that we were applying for all time and saying, okay, that's got you stuck. You can't move without it. How do you loosen those constraints and figure out, okay, when, when do I apply this and when can I tr experiment mm -hmm. with something else? Yeah. And one thing that, you know, again, kind of a thought experiment that can help there is <clears throat> by, you, you mentioned different domains and it's like when you impose a different domain, how this changes, like, oh, I could never t take time off work. Okay. What if, your mom or your spouse or your kid gets sick and you need to take them to the hospital. Well, of course I would leave work for that. It's like, okay, we've now shown that is not an inviolable rule. <laughs> so what is important enough to you that you would take away, step away from work for? And then it's, then it becomes a matter of a trade-off. I remember one, uh, one, one client I worked with, he had this important strategic vision document he was working on. And he had made progress literally in four months. He's like, I just need four hours to concentrate. And I'm like, and you haven't made progress? He's like, yeah. I'm like, is it important? He's like, it's really important. Like, but this is going to set the direction of what we're doing for the next, you know, year. I'm like, uh, what the hell are you doing, first of all? And secondly, you're going to be sick on Friday. He's like, what do you mean you're sick? I'm sick. I'm like, you are taking a sick day on Friday. Because if you were sick, you would stay home. And you'd be in bed, and your team would figure out how to get along without you. So you're going to do that, except instead of being sick, you're going to actually get this document done with four hours of with, with one day of uninterrupted time. He's like, "Can I do that?" I'm like, "Oh, <laughs> like my, maybe let's try it and see what happens." And you know, he, and he did it. Actually, he didn't have to do it. Like once I told him that, he's like, "You know, I could actually just clear my schedule on Friday afternoon and do this without taking a sick day." I'm like, "Great." And then. Having given himself that permission, it was like, oh, I can do this whenever I think something's important enough to do this. But he had been so fixated on the idea that a good leader in his head was responsive, always available on Slack and email, able to get back to you right away, unblock you so quickly that he was like, I can't walk away. I can't. People are always pinging me for stuff. I'm like, they ping you for stuff because you're always available. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that's. That's another interesting aspect of this choice, right? Of not only do we not realize that we have choices, we don't realize that we are already making choices. Yes. And the choices we make create feedback loops. Yes. Yeah. That trap us into thinking that this is the only way it can be. Well, yeah. not just you, but everybody around you. Like we are always trading other people how to treat us. And so if I have declared that my time is available to anybody that wants to make time, that wants to put time on my schedule, they're going to do that. They're going to put time on my schedule. If I respond to every email, then people will send me more emails. And I now feel a lot better for not getting back to a lot of my emails. <laughs> I mean, that's fine. I mean, it's just like, and that's a choice. Like it, if it's important to you to be, if it's important to you to be responsive, then you do that. But it comes at a cost, which is that you don't get to do get to other stuff because you're always responding to emails. And that's the trade-off. And, you know, again, I, I, the example of my director that was like, yeah, I don't respond to email. If it's really important, somebody's going to find me and tell me to do it. <laughs> yeah. It makes me think about, you know, how do we make these trade-offs that we're making a little bit more explicit? for ourselves? How do we identify them? 
I think sometimes it's having a third party mm -hmm. who can say, hey, <laughs> look at this trade-off you're making. But are there other ways that we can find those for ourselves? Yeah. So one uh, exercise one of my coaches offers is it's a very simple daily intention practice. And his idea is you get up in the morning and you know whether you're brushing your teeth in the shower and making coffee, just take a minute going like, what's the most important thing for me to get done today? Like what would make today a success? That's it. Just set the intention, get clear on like, what do I want to get done today? And then at the end of the day, when you're brushing your teeth or getting ready for bed, you take a moment to reflect on the day. What did, did I get the thing done? If not, what got in the way? What internal or external obstacles got in the way of me getting it done? And based on that reflection, what will I do differently tomorrow? Mm -hmm. And if you do that consistently, again, that provides focus, it provides clarity, and it gives you a chance to practice that on a daily basis. And anything you practice daily, you're probably going to get better at over time. Yeah. I want to explore another thing that you said here, where you said, we are always training other people how to treat us. I feel like that's something that, that you could almost write a treatise on. Like, what are the different ways in which we are training others? Yeah. Um, it, it, I'm not sure. Hmm. I have to think about how to explain this. I think it's it's everything that we do because we're part of a system with other human beings. And whatever we do, people are creating their own mental models of us that then they you they build their own actions in response to. <clears throat> and so you know, for for example, like when I was burning out, I was like, yeah, I'll respond to all the emails. I'm going to do every task that's sent to me. And so my manager learned they could put anything, no matter how minor on my plate, and I'd do it. I was training her to just dump everything on me. And she was being rewarded for it. She got all the work done. Like, you know, after I did leave, I left that job, of, you know, later that year after I had that burnout. And uh, I checked back a few months later, and like it literally took four people to, re to replace the work I was doing. Like, yeah, okay, that, that makes you feel a little better. Like, <laughs> I'm not just incompetent. Like, I was actually doing an inhuman amount of work. But here's where I was training them. I was training them. I would say yes. I would do it. I would get it done, and I wouldn't complain. And what I took away from that experience is like, the thing, I can't change what other people ask of me, but I can change how I respond to it. Instead of saying cheerfully, yes, I can do that, I'm like, here's what I would stop doing if I'm going to take that on. What do you think about that? Or I can show the strain. Like, oof, I can take that on, but that's, that's pushing my limits. And, you know, I might, I might have to ease off for a little bit after that if I'm going to take this, you know, this urgent project. So instead of cheerfully saying, I got this, I got this, I got this, boom. It's like, let the machine show a little bit of the strain, show that I'm redlining. And, you know, and then there's a little more feedback to the other person in the system to maybe take different choices. Or maybe not, which is also a possibility. People are like, well, but what if I manage to just keep pushing anyway? I'm like, yeah, okay, great. Now you know. Now you have that information mm -hmm. and you can decide, am I going to keep delivering no matter what and accept the cost to myself and my physical and mental health and the, my relationships to stay here? And if you yeah. do, that's fine. I don't, I'm not telling people that's a wrong choice. There are people that work is the most important thing in their life and great, do that. But just make it consciously. Don't just fall into it and say like, oh, I have no way out. Except that, like, yeah, you know, I'm willing to make this trade off because, you know, we're going public next year, and that's gonna that's gonna set me up for life, and I could I can survive this year. Great, make the choice. Yeah, but make it explicit and make it um, something you're opting into, not defaulting into. Yeah, that because that's the thing that really is so, I guess, disempowering and draining. It's like I don't have any other options. I'm stuck. I can't do anything else. And that's not, it's just not true. <laughs> I, I guess, you know, there's a, 
a famous book, Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl, where he tells the story. He was in the concentration camps in World War II. So he had control of nothing. Like, you know, he was on the verge of death every day. Every single minute of his day was supervised by guards who would beat him for stepping even an inch out of line. And he still could control the story he told himself about his experience. He could say, this is why I'm struggling. This is what's important to me. I will find times to do little moments of kindness for my fellow prisoners. I can choose how I respond to this. Even in that sliver of freedom he had, he could do something with it. And I just find that so inspiring. It's like, there's always, a ch even if you can't choose any of your actions, you can still choose how you, and the stories you tell about them, the mental models you apply. Um, so that's, that's, I think, you know, one of the elements here as well. It's like, if you can't change anything else, change the story at least. Yeah. So I'm curious, do you have, as we, as we're talking about stories and mental models, mm -hmm. do you have stories or mental models that you have found tend to be <clears throat> helpful more regularly that you either use yourself or that you recommend to folks? Yeah, I mean, I've told a couple of them already. The the most important thing first, eighty dollar an hour versus eight thousand dollar an hour. Like those those I, I tell them over and over again because they they resonate with people. Um, here's here's three three more that come to mind. Two more? I don't know. We'll, we'll figure out how many there are later. Uh, <clears throat> I was once taking a workshop for new managers uh, when I became a new manager at Google, and the facilitator walks in and says, "Who here likes to help people?" And everyone's like, me, 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 me. I've heard You're like, I'm here to help people. That's why I'm becoming a manager. And then she was like, who here likes asking for help? And she just let that silence linger. It's like, if nobody asks for help, nobody gets the joy of helping. Huh. That's interesting. So that's one. Another one is, I like talking about capacity and commitments. So if I can only get three things done or five things done or 10 things done, and I commit to more than that, I'm going to disappoint somebody. And I'm going to disappoint somebody in a way that is kind of difficult for them to deal with because they're depending on me to fulfill the commitment. And I get to the moment where I'm supposed to deliver it and I don't have it because I had too many other things on my plate. And now they're kind of stuck. It's much more... So I, I like I bring that up to people. It's like, you may think it's better for you to say yes to everything and figure it out. But in that situation, you are not doing the other person a favor. You would be far kinder to say, I don't know if I'm going to be able to get to that in that time frame. Because then they have options. They have choices. They can say, that's okay, I'll find somebody else. Or that's okay, I can wait. Or they could say, what else are you doing? I'm pretty sure my thing's more important. There's options they have, but if you accept the task, they have no options except waiting for you. And if you become the person that can't deliver on your commitments, that is not good for your brand. Yeah, you have changed from a concrete, manageable disappointment to an unpredictable disappointment. Exactly. So it's like if you if you can only take on five things and you take on five things, you're delivering 100% of your commitments. That's great. But a lot of high performers like, well, I'm being asked to do 10 things. I'm going to take all 10 on and I'll probably deliver seven or eight of them. So eight's more than five. So that's better, right? I'm, I'm delivering more stuff. It's like, well except from the other person's perspective, that 20 or 30% of people you're disappointing. Well, and not just disappointing, I think is key, right? Because right. if I tell them no, they might be disappointed as well. Mm. But you are preventing them from managing around this problem and finding alternatives. Yes, yes. Well put. Yeah, the, you are not dependable. Yeah, that is interesting. Okay. Going in another direction. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that you talked about, and it, maybe it's not even that far of another direction because I think it does tie into mental models. But one of the things we talked about before is empathy. Mm -hmm. 
and empathy as sort of a key underlying skill for a variety of interpersonal effectiveness tasks. Yeah. Do you want to maybe expand on on why you think that's so and and how you're defining empathy? Yeah. Well, I mean, like <clears throat> the example I just gave is an example of empathy. From your perspective, from your perspective, like I'm doing the best I can. I've got 10 things on my plate. I'm trying to get them all done. I'm doing the best I can. What more can you expect of me? But if you take it from the other person's perspective of like, okay, but I'm not getting what I need. And I don't know what I can expect. It changes your perspective. And so that's an example of empathy. Or, um, you know, to, to my example, the most important thing first, it's like that part of the reason my director was so effective was the people, his top stakeholders knew they could count on him to deliver because he would drop everything to make sure they got what he needed. And so he put their needs first. And that's, um, you know, and that's something that you can practice even if they don't tell you what they need. And that, this is the thing I, I try to, to teach my clients. It's like, they're like, well, I don't get one-on-one -on -one time with my VP or CEO or whatever. Like, I, I, how do I know what they care about? I'm like, here's what you do. Every single time they open their mouth in a meeting that you're in attendance, write down what they say and write down what they ask. And the questions they ask and the things they choose to comment on will give you a pretty good map of what they care about. And that's true of everybody that you work with. And... If you want to get them to do something, put it in terms of the thing they care about. It's so obvious. And yet, I don't know, I was probably in my 40s before I really understood it. Like <clears throat> one of my jobs, I was uh, chief of staff at Google and I had to work with cross-functional across sales and finance and other people. And at the time I'd come from the finance team. So I understood what they cared about. Like they cared about predictability. They're like, are we going to deliver on time and on budget? That's what I cared about. So it's like, okay, I'm going to work with you to get you the, the numbers you need for that. The sales team, I'd be like, here's a really cool product feature. They're like, yeah, I don't care. Like, what about this? I'm like, no. No, it's like, then I realized the thing that they always, always, always talked about was, how will this affect my quota? Because that was their compensation. That was their performance. Can they beat their quota? Once I understood that, I was like, oh, anytime it's a sales, I put it in terms of this will help you beat your quota. Then they love talking to me after that. <laughs> I was speaking their language. <laughs> it's it's kind of a dumb example, but it's like, I'm, I'm telling you, if you have sales team, sales members, you want to work with them, just, just go with that. It'll help you. Yeah, no, I think that's that's true. You know, it's really easy to get caught up in our own mental model of what's important. But when we speak from that, we're not going to be heard unless the person we're talking to has the same value system. Yes. Yes. And this is something that engineers in particular struggle with because they're like, but this is the right thing to do. Well, yeah, that's right. Technically given these particular system and, and constraints, but you don't see the constraints, the sales team is working on or the marketing team. And those are different. And the technically, optimal solution may not be the best thing for the for the customer whoever that is and so that's yeah it's taking this moment to to speak to people in a language they understand is going to make you more effective and you know again i work a lot with leaders so there this is much more of an, a thing that's important later in your career because like as an individual contributor it's like yeah for the most part you can just stick to what your manager says and you're going to be okay but as you move up the ranks, it becomes really valuable to be able to understand where other people are you coming know, from. I am increasingly of the belief that empathy is important, even at those low levels of, of IC engineering, mm. because once it, you're delivering code to solve a problem, you need to understand the perspective of the person who's trying to have that problem solved. Yes. Because it's very rare that we can lay out the acceptance criteria to the level of detail that it's actually going to drive all of your technical decision making. Like you have to make some amount of interpretation and decision making. Mm -hmm. And if you don't understand the the viewpoint of the person who's going to use this thing or the person who asked for this feature or this 
your report or whatever it is that you're doing, mm-hmm. those decisions are not going to to flow very naturally. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I, that's absolutely true. And yeah, as you said, there's micro decisions being made and design decisions being made every time you enter a line of code of how you structure things and what's going to be easy and what's going to be hard to modify later. And I, it's funny because I, I guess I, 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 I have a blind spot kind of around that because you know, my first job was as a software consultant. I was writing code for other people. <laughs> so I had to learn what they cared about because that was my job. Like but the acceptance yeah. criteria was like, are they happy? Um, and as part of that, I learned to ask the questions to really understand, like, what are we trying to do here? Like, what's important? And, you know, one of my favorite stories from that time was I had one client I worked with for over a year and he would say like, I want this, I want you to write code that does this. I'd be like, okay, tell me more about like what that's going to actually do. He'd be like, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, oh, this is actually solving this problem over here. And I have a much better way to do that. So yeah. I deliver him something that was not what he asked. He, he said at one point, it's like, I, I hate it, Eric. You, you never give me what I ask for, but it's always what I want. I think that's key because we like to think that our customers, our clients, even our PMs, whoever, are going to come to us with, here's the problem I need solved. Mm-hmm. But humans are intrinsically bad at that. We are really bad at identifying the core problem that needs to be solved. And so what all of these people will do is they'll come to you with a half-baked solution. Yep. I want this thing to do this. Mm-hmm. And as you highlight, when you dig at it, you're like, do you really? <laughs> no, you're trying to solve this other problem. Okay. Now that we've managed to triangulate <laughs> to the problem you're actually trying to solve, we can design a better solution. Yeah. But it comes back to empathy. Yes. So we've touched a bit on this in different pieces, but how do you systematically develop that empathy? One question I like asking myself, because I'll I'll see somebody doing something I don't understand. And I'm like, this makes no sense. And our default reaction in that situation is like, either they're an idiot or they're evil. But those are pretty much it's like they must be doing that because they're an idiot or they're evil. And having worked with a bunch of people at this point, it's like most people are trying to do the best they can given what they know. They're not idiots. They're not evil. They're just doing the best they can. So the question I ask myself in that situation is what must be true in their world that would explain that behavior? Probably not true in my world, because if it was true in my world, I would be like, oh, I understand. But like, what's true in their world that would explain their behavior? It's like, it's kind of like a logic puzzle at that point. It's like, okay, there must be some assumption I'm missing. What is the assumption I'm missing? And having asked that question repeatedly of myself, you know, over the last you know, 10 something years, I've gotten pretty good at going like, oh, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Here's what they might be thinking. And I can come up with stories and I can come up with hypotheses. I can test. I'm like, hey, so it seems like this is important to you. Oh yeah, that's really important. Like, ah. Uh, okay, that explains what's going on here. I love that because it, and it comes back to a core principle that I have around this, which is we shy away from this human stuff because we think it is like vague and fuzzy and unsolvable. Mm -hmm. But we as humans are actually reasonably predictable. (laughs) We follow patterns and we are not as delineated as, you know, writing software code and dealing with a compiler error. Mm -hmm. But you can form hypotheses. You can test them. You can like notice these patterns and they start to work out over time. Oh, I, so that reminds me of another exercise I like to give people. It's like, this person is driving me nuts. I don't understand them at all. I'm like, okay, I want you to put down, I know you're very frustrated with them, but like, let's put down the emotion and be a scientist and observe them. And what do they actually do? Pretend you're playing a video game and they're the video game boss It's like, okay, when this happens, they do this. When this happens, they do this. Okay. And like, what do they actually do? Because what's holding the the, the person back in this situation, it's like, they should do X. My manager should be looking out for you. My manager should be doing this. This other person should be doing this. And then they're just frustrated over and over and over again. And what I tell people in that situation is like, the problem is not the other person. 
The problem is you haven't accepted the reality. Here, let me show you. If I have this thing and I drop it, you are not frustrated by that because it happens every single time. And yet you have described this behavior to me of this person five times in a row. We've talked about it for the last three months, every single time, and you're still frustrated by it. So when are you going to wake up and accept the reality? This is that person. This is who they are. And what are you going to do differently? You know, like an example, there was like one of my clients was dealing with an engineer that wasn't reliable. Like they would say they'd do something and they would deliver. He's like, they never deliver. I'm like, okay, you're an engineer. If you have an unreliable component in your system, what do you do? He's like, well, I design around it. I make some redundancy. I'm like, why is this hard? <laughs> like, you know what to do. The problem is not the other person. The problem is you have not accepted the other person being who they are. I love that. I just realized we are getting close already to the end of our hour. And I want to make sure, are there any topics that we haven't touched on that you think would be important for us to talk about before we wrap? I guess I, I would, I, we've kind of touched on it, but I'll, I'll just state it explicitly. Like one of the most powerful concepts for me was it doesn't have to be this way. If we accept our current reality as fixed and unchangeable, then we're stuck. There's nothing we can do. And what I've learned over the last several years of my own personal development is it doesn't have to be this way. I can make different choices and get different results. Instead of burning out, I could say, I'm not working that hard. And yeah, there's consequences. I'm not saying there's easy choices, but I can make a different choice and get different results. We have more power over the systems we're in than we think. So if you feel like you don't have options, I want you to actually look at what you're doing and ask yourself, how am I contributing to keeping this thing stuck in this position? And what could I do differently to get a different result? All right, that's it for this human skills interview. If you enjoyed it, please consider liking this video and subscribing to this channel. You can also subscribe to the human skills newsletter, which there's a link to right down below to get notified of interviews like this as they come out. Take care y'all. This is K-Ball signing out.